If you have prediabetes or diabetes and are looking for the best diet to lower your blood sugar, this episode is for you. You'll learn five diabetes diet tips to lower blood sugar and insulin to prevent, reduce, or eliminate blood sugar lowering medications. While you may in part know what to eat, this episode will dive deeper into the why behind the recommendations. When you understand why making certain choices is important, you're gonna be more likely to follow through consistently. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte, founder of Zibli, a personalized online program that helps you reverse insulin resistance for lasting weight loss and disease prevention. As a geriatric physical therapist, I've seen up close and personal the negative effects of diabetes, amputations, dementia, heart disease, peripheral neuropathy. It's not fun. Diabetes is much easier to prevent and reverse proactively then deal with expensive and heartbreaking consequences. Diabetes is called the silent killer because blood sugar and more importantly, blood insulin can rise slowly and largely undetected for decades. Doctors rarely get concerned until you're in the diabetic range when they can do something about it in the form of offering you a prescription. One of our Zivli members recently said her A1C came back at 5.9 and her doctor wrote a little excellent on it. And we were both confused because 5.9 is not excellent. It's in the prediabetes range, but physicians often offer little more than lose 10% of your body weight or just eat healthy and exercise when you ask them what to do. That's where we come in to offer specific personalized education and ongoing coaching support. There's an enormous amount of conflicting and confusing information online about how to eat with diabetes. My hope is that this episode breaks through some of the noise and politics to give you effective and specific ways to lower blood sugar. And I'll be discussing a lot of details today. Know that many food examples of the nutrients discussed can be found in our ultimate food guide, which you can grab at zivli.com forward slash ultimate food guide. And it is free. Zivli members, you can look at the fuel lessons and the fun sheets for more specifics here as well. If changing your nutrition seems daunting or intimidating to you, that's okay. Try picking just one tip that resonates with you the most. Narrowing your focus will help you make the most out of your efforts. It's important that whatever you choose to do, you feel good about it, not restricted as those negative emotions tend to backfire. Before we start, know that at Zivli, we believe no food is off limits unless you say it is. We advocate for progress, not perfection, and take a whole person approach. Nutrition is a big component of a healthy lifestyle, but there are so many other levers that you can adjust to lower insulin and glucose, including use of intermittent fasting, optimizing sleep, stress, and movement, and reducing toxins. If nutrition isn't the best place for you to start, there are many other opportunities to improve your health. Any effort counts, and the temporary discomfort of changing your lifestyle will save you a lot of discomfort from diabetes in the long run. Diabetes diet tip number one is to eat real food. This is the golden rule of nutrition. When I say processed food, that means anything that didn't either grow in the ground, swim in the sea, or live on the land. Single ingredient foods are always your best option. As often as possible, your food should not need a food label. When food is processed, it's often stripped of the protein, fat, and fiber, and micronutrients that reduce inflammation and slow the digestion of the food. If you've been drinking the glucose control boost, I'm talking to you right now. There are over 19 ingredients in this. Along with protein, it also contains inflammatory seed oils, fructose, and sucralose. We will cover why these ingredients aren't good for blood sugar later. You'll be much better off eating whole food protein sources. Diabetes diet tip number two is to eat more whole food fiber, ideally from sources that are also low in starch and sugar. Dr. Robert Lustig explains why he thinks fiber may be the most important nutrient because it protects the liver and feeds the gut. There are two types of fiber and your body needs both, soluble and insoluble. These occur together in plants. 
So the soluble fiber is globular and it holds things together like the jelly, for example. So psyllium, pectin, and inulin. And insoluble is the stringy stuff in celery like cellulose. You need both because they have different jobs and together their geometry forms a barrier in your gut. When fiber is consumed within real food, the insoluble fiber, which is the stringy stuff, forms a lattice work on the inside of your duodenum, which is the first part of your small intestine. The soluble fiber or the globular stuff plugs the holes in the lattice. Together, this plugged lattice forms an impenetrable barrier along the duodenal wall, which has many benefits. This geometry that protects the gut only comes when soluble and insoluble fiber are eaten together from real food, not a low carb tortilla or bar with 14 grams of processed fiber added back to the food. Now I believe in a good, better, best model. So if it's taco night, a corn tortilla with fewer net carbs is better than the flour. A low carb tortilla is better than the regular and skipping both processed foods all together and opting for a big taco salad with avocado, veggies, and maybe smaller portions like an eighth to a quarter of a cup of beans and rice is best. Insoluble fiber isn't compressible. You can't process it down and add it back to the food. It's not the stuff found in Metamucil or psyllium husk supplements. It's only found structurally intact in real food. The high added dose of soluble fiber from the chicory root, which is inulin, a soluble fiber, is what causes the bloating, gas, and diarrhea associated with these fiber one bars. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see there are a lot of red circles around certain ingredients on this fiber one bar package. Those are all different names for sugar in the bar. We'll touch on all the different names of added sugar in this fiber one bar later. Dr. Lustig outlines six major reasons why he thinks fiber from real food is important for controlling blood sugar and lowering insulin resistance. Number one, both kinds of fiber work together to form a gel on the inside of the intestinal wall to reduce the rate of absorption of starches and sugars and slow the breakdown of starches. So this reduced absorption from meals reduces the transport of the nutrients to the liver, and it prevents the liver from turning those into fat and prevents liver insulin resistance. Number two, fiber helps slow the glucose and insulin response following a meal, thus reducing fat storage. Number three, fiber supports the growth of healthy gut bacteria. Number four, fiber helps the food move through the intestinal tract faster, and it generates the release of a gut hormone called peptide YY, which is released into the bloodstream and goes to the brain so you feel full and reduce second portions or snacking between meals. Number five, soluble fiber is metabolized by gut bacteria into short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. These short chain fatty acids feed the microbiome of the colon and are absorbed into the bloodstream where they are anti-inflammatory and suppress insulin release from the pancreas. Number six, insoluble fiber acts as a mild abrasive in the lumen or the inner lining of the colon, which dislodges and sloughs off old dead cells and reduces the risk of colon cancer. The processed food industry will market the benefits of added fiber to various products. These are especially popular in keto and low carb products, which have reduced the net carb count by adding a ton of fiber back into the processed food. And while they can add back some soluble fiber, such as inulin and the fiber one bars, they cannot put to back together the insoluble fiber lost during processing. This is why most 100% whole grain breads really are not much better for you than white bread. While all of the parts of the grain may allow them to say it's 100% whole grain, it's still been processed and will spike blood sugar and insulin almost as fast as white bread. The goal is to have whole foods that have structurally and functionally maintained insoluble and soluble fiber. In our ultimate food guide, we've listed over 40 high fiber foods according to their designated food group. You can pause the video and take notes of these charts or download our ultimate food guide for free at zivly.com forward slash ultimate food guide. Zivly members, be sure to look in the carb fun sheet for more detail and information on fiber. A few of my go-to fiber sources are chia seeds, 
broccoli, carrots, sweet potatoes, pumpkin seeds, raspberries, avocado, nuts, and beans. Women should aim for at least 25 grams of fiber per day and men for 35 grams. If you've never tracked your macronutrients to learn how many carbs, protein, and fat grams are in your food, this can be helpful to optimize your nutrition. You can download free videos to get set up on the Carb Manager app, which does show the grams of fiber at zivly.com forward slash macros. Diabetes diet tip number three is to reduce fructose, which is a type of simple sugar. The best book that I've read on fructose is Nature Wants Us to Be Fat by Dr. Richard Johnson, who I'm really excited to interview later this month for the podcast. The importance of a low fructose diet is discussed in many other great books for diabetes, including Metabolical by Dr. Robert Lustig, The Diabetes Code by Dr. Jason Fung, and Why We Get Sick by Dr. Ben Bickman. I had the honor of interviewing Dr. Bickman on the podcast to talk about insulin resistance and I'll link to his episode in the description as well. To appreciate this point of lowering fructose, you'll need a baseline understanding of monosaccharides, which are simple sugars or single sugar molecules, and disaccharides, which are two monosaccharides bonded together. The three monosaccharides I discuss are glucose, fructose, and galactose. The two main disaccharides I discuss are sucrose, and lactose. The first is sucrose, which is table sugar. It's one molecule of glucose bonded to one molecule of fructose. Lactose is one molecule of glucose bonded with one molecule of galactose. Starch is a polysaccharide, which means many molecules of glucose strung together. I want you to note that high fructose corn syrup has glucose and fructose, but they're no longer bonded together. They were isolated and then added back together. So this is even worse than regular sugar because there is no bond to break during digestion. So it's even worse for your liver than table sugar where they are bonded together. These next several pictures are from Metabolical by Dr. Robert Lustig. Glucose and fructose, while both simple sugars are metabolized very differently. Glucose can be metabolized by any cell in the body. Only about 20% of the glucose you eat is metabolized in the liver, and the majority of it is turned into liver glycogen. Now, glycogen is just a bunch of glucose molecules bonded together so that your body can access it quickly and easily when your blood sugar gets a little bit low. So think of it as the short-term storage of glucose that you may need, for example, during a low-carb diet or when intermittent fasting. Conversely, 100% of the fructose you eat is metabolized in the liver. The byproducts of fructose metabolism include uric acid, which leads to a higher blood pressure, increased triglycerides, increased liver fat, leading to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and insulin resistance in the liver. The next pictures show the structure of glucose and fructose. They demonstrate that a sugar is not a sugar. Glucose is a six-membered ring and is more stable than the five-membered ring of fructose. The five-member ring fructose breaks down more easily, driving the primary aging process seven times faster than glucose. In other words, calories from fructose cause seven times the cellular aging as the same calories from glucose. That's why a calorie is not a calorie. Fructose also generates 100 times the number of oxygen radicals and leads to more oxidative stress in the body, which is a direct cause of insulin resistance. Understanding that fructose is worse for your liver health, insulin resistance, and blood sugar is vital because often diabetics are taught to use the glycemic index of foods and choose low glycemic carbs, meaning those that don't spike blood glucose. The glycemic index ranks foods by how much they raise blood glucose from zero to hundred with lower being better. When fructose is eaten, it doesn't raise blood sugar, also known as blood glucose. Fructose and fructose containing foods are actually considered lower on the glycemic index charts. So only looking at the glycemic index completely misses the worst sugar and most important driver of poor metabolic health, fructose. A great example of this is comparing fruit juice to table sugar on the glycemic index. Table sugar is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. 
Apple juice is 65% fructose and 35% glucose. Apple juice has a glycemic index of 41. Table sugar, because it's higher in glucose, which remember is less metabolically harmful than fructose, has a glycemic index of 65. So worse than apple juice, even though it has less fructose. And that is why my children don't drink juice. I view juice like pop, it's just sugar. And it will raise your blood sugar and your insulin and contribute to fatty liver and insulin resistance. If you wanna get healthy and reduce prediabetes and diabetes blood sugars, you have to lower the fructose. To reduce fructose in your diet, the best thing that you can do is eat real food that doesn't have a food label. The second best thing you can do is to read your food label and look for the added sugar line. This represents how much added sugar is added to the food. Note that some natural sweeteners such as honey, agave, and fruit juice may not be included in this total because they're considered natural. So the real amount of added sugar may be higher based on the ingredients. You'll see this agave food label doesn't have an added sugar line even though it's all just sugar. The third thing to do is to look at the actual ingredients and screen for some of the more than 200 names for sugar. Returning to this fiber one bar, some circled in red include sugar, corn syrup, high maltose corn syrup, fructose, and malt. Real food doesn't have added sugar, but you'll still wanna significantly reduce sweeteners and fruit juices. Take a look at this table again that shows the amount of fructose and glucose in many natural sweeteners. Agave, honey, maple syrup, and juices should all be treated like regular table sugar because they have similar metabolic effects, sometimes worse, depending on the ratio of fructose to glucose and their processing. Diabetes diet tip number four is to reduce artificial sweeteners and food additives that still raise blood glucose. Look for the following ingredients on your food labels. If they have them, throw them out or really reduce your portions sucralose, acylfame potassium, aspartame, saccharin, and maltodextrin. You may not have caught it, but maltodextrin was one of the ingredients in the fiber one bar. These sweeteners are so common in processed health foods, including ice drinks, which you can see here has sucralose. The first four ingredients I mentioned are artificial sweeteners, and while they may not always acutely raise blood glucose or insulin in many, they have been shown to impair your gut microbiome, which will harm your long-term blood sugar regulation. Furthermore, we must remember that blood glucose is a downstream effect. We measure it because we can with things like continuous glucose monitors. However, insulin is what matters more. And as of 2022, when I'm recording this, the technology doesn't exist yet, at least commercially, to continually see how different ingredients affect insulin. Zero calorie drinks that are sweet will also trigger the hypothalamic region in your brain to make you think calories are coming in. The hypothalamus sends a signal to your pancreas via your vagal nerve that says, hey, you better get some insulin pumped out because we have some sweet calories coming in. The insulin gets pumped out, but there's not a direct rise in blood glucose from any caloric sugar consumption. So insulin pushes glucose already in your bloodstream into your cells which lowers blood sugar. And this drop in blood sugar then sends a signal to your brain to increase your hunger and make you wanna eat more. Lastly, sweet things, even if they are sugar-free, light up the same region in your brain as cocaine. There is strong evidence that for some people, sugar and sweet things may truly be addicting. One study found nearly all rats preferred water sweetened with saccharin to cocaine. And saccharin is one of the sweeteners found in sweet and low. The first ingredient is actually dextrose, which is another one of those sneaky words for sugar. Dextrose is just sugar that comes from corn or wheat. Having anything sweet will just make you want more of it. Increase your hunger, alter your gut for the worst, and in some cases, actually raise your insulin and glucose levels either directly or indirectly. If you want something sweet, I recommend sticking to a small amount and in moderation of stevia, monk fruit, and erythritol. I like what Dr. Jason Funk says in the obesity code about added sugar and how much is safe. He said it's like cigarettes. Obviously, the less, the better. 
Currently, the American Heart Association recommends no more than 24 grams of added sugar per day for women, no more than 36 for men. That, uh, that adds up pretty fast when you eat or drink processed foods. And full disclosure, I usually have an unhealthy dessert once a week, but my baseline nutrition is healthy so that I can tolerate that without harming my health so much. And I have found a lot of healthier alternatives to the high sugary desserts to satisfy my sweet tooth. Diabetes diet tip number five is to choose whole foods that are lower in starch and sugar and higher in fiber, protein, and fat. Fat has the lowest insulin response of all macronutrients. Protein is next. Starches and sugars have the highest. Again, tracking your macronutrients can be extremely helpful to learn the macronutrient breakdown of different foods. For example, often people eat oatmeal at breakfast because they think it's healthy, and it is better than more processed breakfast cereals that are loaded with added sugar and other ingredients, but it's still mostly carbs in the form of starch that will spike your blood sugar. This is why eating a plant-based diet doesn't always work to lower your blood sugar. It all depends on what's in the plants that you're choosing and how processed the food is. For example, one cup of oatmeal has 24 grams of net carbs, four grams of fiber, six grams of protein, and three grams of fat. Three eggs has two grams of net carbs, no fiber, 19 grams of protein, and 16 grams of fat. Neither of these would, co would constitute a full nutrient balanced meal. But I use these as an example to show you that often foods that we think are healthy, such as oatmeal, aren't the best choice to lower blood sugar because they are still high in carbohydrates, which will still raise blood glucose and insulin. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you're carnivore or keto and you're not properly including low carb fiber and micronutrient rich foods in your diet, you're missing the boat on the fiber. Foods that are high in protein and low in carbs include steak, salmon, shrimp, protein powders, edamame, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt. I often speak of protein tack-ons, which you could just add to a meal to increase the protein amount. Things like string cheese, cottage cheese, shredded cheese, Greek yogurt, milk, hemp hearts, smaller portions of protein bars or shakes, peanut butter, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, edamame, peanut butter powder, hard boiled eggs, minimally processed jerky, beans or lentils, or pasta made from beans or lentils. Now foods that are high in healthy fat and low in carbs would be olive oil, olives, avocado, avocado oil, a lot of nuts and seeds. We have nut and seed butters, fatty fish like salmon, which is also high in anti-inflammatory omega-3s, flaxseed, flaxseed oil, chia and basil seeds. And again, there's a little bit of overlap between the protein and fat tack-ons because foods contain a combination of macronutrients, but you have all of those cheeses, the Greek yogurt, the hemp hearts, the chia and basil seeds, the peanut butter, pumpkin seeds, hard boiled eggs, avocados, olives, nuts, butter or ghee, avocado or olive oil dressings, and heavy cream. A quick note is that you'll want to avoid inflammatory fats found in processed seed oils like canola, corn, cottonseed, soy, sunflower, safflower, grape seed, and rice bran. So start screening your foods for these oils along with the five ingredients I mentioned earlier, which were sucralose, acylfame potassium, aspartame, saccharin, and maltodextrin. And then of course, you'll want to look for added sugars. You'll be hard pressed to find a processed food without at least one of these unhealthy ingredients. Hence the recommendation to eat real food. While trans fats have been banned from the US food supply, during frying of foods like French fries or fried chicken, the heat applied to the vegetable oil actually creates trans fats. And what's worse is that the trans fat content of that oil increases each time the oil is reused. You can also create trans fats with healthy fats like olive oil if you cook them past their smoke point. The bottom line is to prioritize whole real food. Eat plenty of fiber from low carb plants. Eat adequate protein to support healthy muscles, ideally from animal sources as these are complete protein and concentrated without the carbs and eat plenty of healthy fats. 
Regarding the protein source, research supports that chicken and fatty fish are healthier choices than red meat, which can increase uric acid levels. And especially if you're insulin resistant, we don't want that. So I recommend biasing your protein intake towards eggs, chicken, fish, or plants, and having as high quality beef as possible, a little bit more moderately, for example, a couple times a week. Everyone will be different on this point of view, but the book Nature Wants Us to Be Fat and Metabolical did a nice job outlining why a protein is not a protein and being a little bit more selective about where we get our protein from and the quality of that protein can help reduce inflammation. Now, a little side note, you will want to really reduce or avoid the processed meats with nitrates and all sorts of other inflammatory ingredients added back to them. Regarding the total amount of protein, we typically recommend between 1.1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day as a general guideline. Older adults may benefit from more. Very active adults or people who are really working to build muscle mass may also benefit from more. It's very person specific. So for example, if you're 180 pounds, you're gonna take that divided by 2.2 to get your weight in kilograms, which is 82 times by 1.1 is 90 grams of protein a day. Also remember that you're gonna to wanna to have at least 30 grams of protein per meal to stimulate new muscle growth. When it comes to muscle, if you're not actively building with protein and strength training, you're losing. And if you're losing, your metabolism is slowing and insulin resistance in the muscle is increasing, leading to more fat in the muscle for weaker muscles. And it's also not good for your bones to under eat protein. They need protein too. To get a download of these foods with plenty of examples, grab our ultimate food guide at zivly.com forward slash ultimate food guide. Zivly members just rewatch the fuel lessons, or if you have specific questions, reach out via our support email at support at zivly.com and we can help you or get you scheduled for coaching during office hours. Remember the goal is not to lose weight. It's to improve your health and keep any weight you do lose off. That's exactly what we help our Zivli members learn how to do. We have equal emphasis on a low insulin inflammation strategy and mindset and habit change techniques. To learn more about our program, just go to zivli.com. That's Z I V L I.com. And from there, you can join directly or book a free discovery meeting to get your questions answered and see if it's a good fit for your needs. If you found this episode helpful, please be sure to subscribe on YouTube or your podcast platform if you're listening and definitely share it with a friend or even your doctor. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll talk with you at the same time, same place next week. Bye for now.